Thank you. The first scriptures I want to share with you tonight, I did not give them to the guys. There won't be any uh, screen. So if you have a Bible or can get near one, uh, that might be helpful to you. We're going to go to Acts chapter 13. This is not the message per se, but more of an introduction uh, to what we believe the Lord wants us uh, to do this evening. Uh, let me uh, real quickly introduce you and or maybe just help you become better acquainted with the men who are our candidates uh, tonight for ordination. We uh, obviously our church is 66 years old and through the years our church has had a part in ordaining a lot of people. Under my ministry we have never done real intensive ordination councils, um, interrogations, all that stuff. Uh, we have been very selective, and we've God's given us the opportunity with these two men tonight to observe them and to get to know them, who they are, what they believe, and to see evidence of God's call upon their lives and God's hand upon their lives. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Clayton, and his wife Tara are down here at the front of their family. Uh, he graduated <clears throat> from uh, Hiles Anderson in 2012, and then again in 2014. Uh, was that a master's? Uh, man, I didn't know you were that smart. Um, and then he did an internship in Africa, right? For how long? Six months. Six months. Um, came back here. And in 2015, uh, the Claytons left us and went to Glen Burnie, Maryland. We were at a couple's retreat, ironically enough. And I got a call from Pastor Lou Rossi, and he said, uh, I need somebody, I need someone to come and help me. He said, um, I, I really need a basketball coach. And he said, there'd be a lot more to it than that, but I would need someone who's capable of coaching basketball. And so I went downstairs at the retreat and said to Charlie, would this interest you? If it would, I'll give him your name and number. And if not, I'll tell him that I, I don't know anyone. And uh, he, he talked with his wife and they wanted to, me to uh, pass that information along. So in 2015, uh, they went to serve with Pastor Rossi and served there for four years in many, many, many different capacities. Um, Brother Charlie ended up being the administrator of their Christian school, and that may not have been his exact title. Um, and then the Lord just kind of stirred their nest there in Maryland, and I, I felt the leading of the Lord after he had made it clear they were going to come back to Durham. Uh, that, that was determined before I ever approached him, and I asked him about coming and serving with us. And uh, we're so thankful. Since 2019, uh, they have been involved here and been a huge blessing. Uh, I won't even try to go into all the different things that uh, Brother Charlie does, but we appreciate he and his wife and their service. Uh, Brother Clint graduated from Hiles Anderson in 2017 and uh, came straight here. No one knew. No one knew. Uh, that I had reached out to him. Um, his family didn't know. I, I don't believe I had talked with Brother John. His family didn't know. Uh, Amber's family didn't know. And to be honest, I had no idea that he would be interested. And I sent him, I think, a text uh, one night and said, look, would you ever be interested in talking with me about coming and serving with us? And he said that he would. And uh, that was a good day for us. This is uh, Brother Clint's fifth year on staff. And uh, he and Charlie both heavily involved in the school. Uh, but also, uh, Brother Clint has, and, and we knew this, he has a, a, a great burden for the bus ministry. And uh, we felt like that was something we really needed to invest more time and effort in. And uh, so we came, he came, and uh, we started trying to get some momentum, and then COVID hit, and we had to park the buses for a year, 
my wife and I were leaving today to go to lunch, and uh, one of the buses was pulling out of one of the apartment complexes down here at Cheek and Hardy, and I said to her, it is so good to see buses coming back out of the apartment complexes again. And uh, so we thank the Lord for uh, both of these men, and I'm thankful for their wives. I've learned this in uh, close to 40 years of ministry, that for some men, their greatest liability is their wife. I don't think that's restricted to ministry, but it is very obvious in ministry. Uh, For other men, their greatest asset is their wife. And that would be the case for me. And I believe that to be the case for these two men. And uh, both of these ladies are very, very supportive, very loyal. Uh, it's um, all of you have hard jobs. If you work, you have a hard job. Um, but ministry can be tough, and it can be demanding. And there's a rigid schedule, and uh, then there's a rigid schedule, and then there is all the extra stuff that's not in the rigid schedule. Uh, And my wife, over these 39 years this summer that we have been involved in full-time ministry, uh, has been left high and dry again and again and again and again. Uh, I have had to leave my family on vacation to come home for a day because of an emergency and go back. Just to be honest with you, some ladies would have a hard time dealing with that. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for uh, Tara and for Amber <clears throat> and for the support that they show their husbands in this area. I want to share a few scriptures with you and uh, then we'll get into our message. In Acts chapter 13, The Bible said in verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from the, and thence they sailed to Cyprus. In Acts chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible said, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord <clears throat> on whom they believed. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul writes to Timothy, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We believe speaking of his ordination. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul said to Titus, uh, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders uh, in every city as I had appointed thee. So we're not, tonight, we're not here, all we're here tonight to do is to say we see evidence and we are convinced of the call of God upon the lives of these men, and we are saying amen. Amen. That's that's what ordination is. It is the church saying, you testify of God's call upon your life. (coughs) We see evidence (coughs) of God's call upon your life. Stuart Mason, I think, gave me the crud. Uh, And I'm just kidding about that. And we agree with God's choice. That's what ordination is. Go to our text tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, we'll move pretty quickly this evening. And after our invitation, at the conclusion of the service, we'll uh, pray over these men. We have a couple of other things we want to do. And uh, you'll be glad that you were able to be a part of this service. 1 Timothy chapter 1 The Apostle Paul is writing to his son in the ministry, a much younger man named Timothy. And you know, when you think about it, he could have talked with Timothy about his goals in the ministry. Maybe he did in some other places. He could have talked with him about the grind of the ministry. 
and I've already alluded to that. And he could have talked about what he had gained in the ministry. And I have gained much more than I have given, I promise you. Uh, God has been so good. But what he chose to speak to him about in this verse that we're going to look at in just a moment, Paul spoke of his gratitude to God for putting him into the ministry. Notice 1 Timothy 1.12. It's my life verse. It's the verse, if anyone ever asks me to sign their Bible, I'll always say 1 Timothy 1.12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for the account of me faithful, putting me into the ministry. By the way, I firmly believe this. Every person in this room is in the ministry. And because you're not sitting on the front row to be ordained tonight doesn't mean that you're less in the eyes of God than the one behind the pulpit. We're all in the ministry. Some of us believe God has called us to do this in a full-time capacity, that, that we can give ourselves to ministry, and that's that, that's the difference. It's no different than you. And truthfully, there are many, we, we refer to most of the people in the church as laymen. There are many laymen or lay people who are more effective in ministry than some men who have been ordained to ministry. Because you get a paycheck from a church or a school or some other ministry, or because you have reverend in front of your name, which I don't ever use. Uh, but because of that, it doesn't make, you, doesn't make you more important to God, doesn't make you more effective in ministry. All right? You're going to leave here tonight. Tomorrow, I will spend pretty much all my day in the office studying, administrating, organizing, and preparing for Next weekend, Wednesday night, uh, we finish up school registration tomorrow, all that stuff. And I'm going to be around about 25 other people who have the opportunity to come to work here every day. You know where you're going? You're going out into the world. And you're going to rub shoulders with people. And you're going to have coworkers that you're going to be able to influence. You're going to be salt and light in the lives of people I will never, ever, ever even meet. So don't you think tonight that because you don't get a paycheck to do what you do. By the way, I sometimes envy people whose motive must be pure. You know, if you, if you, if you work here and you get a paycheck, then there are some things that we say, this, we want you to do this, all right? But a lot of you do what you do completely out of a pure motive because you, you want to do it. And so I don't, I don't want anyone to leave here tonight feeling like, you know... You know, maybe I should have, or, or I, I just don't feel... No, we're all in ministry. But here's the question, are we all grateful? Are we all grateful? So I want to talk to you tonight about a grateful minister. Notice what Paul said here in this passage. First of all, I believe that Paul was grateful for his calling. Paul was, he was thankful that God had called him. Paul referred to his calling when he is speaking before Agrippa in Acts 26. Let me read the verses for you. And I said, who art thou, Lord? This was on the road to Damascus. And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, look at what he said, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I, now, now I send thee to open their eyes. You know what? Hey, you ought to thank God every day. And I ought to thank God every day. And you men ought to thank God every day that God has called us to do his work with our lives. We ought to be thankful and grateful, hey, that we get to sing in a choir. You ought to be grateful that we get to preach, that we get to teach. We ought to be grateful that we get. Hey, it ought not be I got to. It ought to be I get to. And, and, and we're using us. They'll tell us a little bit later on in the service about the call of God upon their lives. God has a plan for the life of every believer. And his plan 
for these men is, is, it goes back to maybe a teen camp or a church service or a youth conference where God said, I, I want you to surrender your life. I want you to serve me with your life. And I remember when God called me, I remember being in that service in youth conference in 1978. It was a long time ago. Uh, and I was privileged to be there and a public high school graduate just out of school six weeks. And God just made it very clear to me that he wanted me to do something. I didn't know what it was. Truthfully, have I, had I known what it was, I probably would never have done it. But he, he made it very clear that night that he wanted me to do something. And, and I, I went forward. You say, what would you do? I surrendered. I just surrendered. I just surrendered to his call upon my life. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. So here's what he said. He said, now you've been called. He said, now fulfill your calling. We understand none of us are worthy. But man, I want to be. You know what I'm saying? I want to be. I want to do well. I, I want to give everything I have. I, I want to fulfill the call of God upon my life. You know what God is saying here? <coughs> He's saying... I want you to serve me on my terms and not yours. I want you to make me the first love of your life. And I want you to pursue what matters most to me. And I want you to proclaim nothing less and nothing more than the word of God. So you ought to be grateful. Paul said, you be grateful for your calling. Number two, be grateful for your enabling. For your enabling. Look at verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The word enable there means to strengthen. Jesus put it this, he put it this way, for without me, you can do nothing. And, and, and as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us, and especially you two men tonight, need to understand you will not make it, but that he enables you. You can, only, you can only tough it out so long. That's what we're prone to do. You know, we just we suck it up and we, we grit our teeth and we just tough it out and we push through. And you know what you get? Well, I'm going to tell you what that brings. Complete exhaustion. frustration. But oh, let me tell you, whenever we rely upon his enablement and his strength, and Paul later on put it this way or prior to, he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And that has got to be the source of our strength. We can run all over the country, go into conference after conference, listen to podcast after podcast, read blog after blog. But at the end of the day, what we need to do the work of the ministry is enabling that only comes from God. It was 43 years ago, in 1978, when I surrendered, I had no idea, no idea what I was getting into. Kind of like marriage. I had no idea. You know what I thought? I thought, everybody's going to love me. Right? That's what I thought. Everybody's going to be happy for me. Everybody's, everybody's going to be excited for me. And I thought everybody was going to support me. But you know what I've learned through the years? I, I've learned through the years that following Jesus and his plan for your life will naturally create opposition. And if you are making a difference for the kingdom, the enemy is going to raise up opposition. And sometimes they have the same names as your friends. Oh, sometimes they are your friends. 
And they don't necessarily mean to be used in that way. They're not hateful, mean people, but they ignorantly are used of Satan himself to create opposition to what God is trying to use you to do. And, and so what we have to understand is that it is spiritual warfare. And you will never win a spiritual battle with carnal weapons. And so we ought to thank God tonight for our enabling. Psalm 100 verse 3, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Here's a, here's a statement that I, I jotted down. Any good thing that has happened in my ministry has been because of him and in spite of me. Any good thing, my marriage, my children, the church, folks that have been saved, any good thing that has happened in my ministry has been because of him and in spite of me. And that's true in your life if you'd be honest about it. So we ought to be grateful servants, grateful for his calling, grateful for his enabling. And, and, and here's what I've learned, that he is the only one who's going to get you through the tough times. Dr. Lee Robertson pastored the Highland Park Baptist Church for over 40 years. And I remember I used to hear that as a young preacher. I said, man, 40 years. And now I'm looking at this and I'm saying, I've been here 34 years. Lee Robertson's dead. <laughs> 40 years. Brother Hiles said about Lee Robertson, the reason Lee Robertson pastored the Great Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee for 40 years is because Lee Robertson stayed when everyone else left. I, I, I'm going to give Dr. Robertson credit for this quote. I, I'm not sure that I'm giving, I, I want to say I've heard him say it. Someone asked him one time, said, Dr. Dr. Robertson, how did you make it 40 years? And he said, I had to survive the quitting places. I had to survive the quitting places. By the way, those places come into every marriage, every occupation, and the ministry. So tonight we can rejoice that God has called us. You men can rejoice that God has called you. You can be grateful for your enabling. And then thirdly, I notice in verse 12, look there if you would, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful. I like this, putting me into the ministry. I wrote this down. You ought to be grateful for your placement. Yeah. Grateful for your placement. Putting me, it means to set or to put or to place. It is the only time in Scripture that that exact phrase is used. The only time. Paul said, I just want to thank God for putting me in the ministry. You see, I, I, when I read that, I think about I used to, one time somebody tried to teach me. I've never, I don't like events where you have three or four forks. I, I, bet I don't go to those kind of events very often. But once in a while I'll go somewhere where all the proper placement is there of all the silverware and, and everything is in a certain place for a specific purpose. All right? Just give me a fork. As a matter of fact, depending on what the food is, I don't even need a fork. <laughs> right? Just don't get in my way. Just give me a fork. Maybe if it's a steak, give me a knife. If it's a really good steak, you don't even need a knife. I don't need a spoon. I don't even use spoons unless I'm eating cereal <laughs> or soup. It's kind of tough to eat soup with a fork, but everything's got its place. And some of you ladies know how to do all that. And you know that, no, that, that fork that's just a little bit shorter than the others, that has a specific place. Do you know what I'm thankful for? I'm grateful tonight that God not only put me in the ministry, but I'm grateful tonight that God put me here. 
You see, I, I think he orchestrates that kind of stuff. Velma, I failed to mention you. You're, we're still waiting, right? And, and she's waiting on some uh, pathology reports. I want you to pray with her about that. I apologize. Um, but everything, everything has a place. Everything has a place. And you know what? I, I don't know. I just think I, I'm in my place. You could have said amen right there. I would have felt a lot better. <laughs> Obviously, you disagree. <laughs> and occasionally, I go somewhere. I will feel like the Lord gives me liberty to go somewhere and, and try to be a help to a church some Sunday. But it's a little awkward for me. You know why? Because it's not my place. I promise you, we were sitting at lunch today. And uh, how many of you were at the retreat? Raise your hand. All right. You remember Brother Mason's lecture about your cell phone at the table? He was just preaching. Because <laughs> we were at lunch today, and he had his cell phone out, and the next thing I knew, he had it, he had it leaning against his tea glass. <laughs> so anything you heard him say, you can just forget it all. And I, I did, he, he was trying to carry on a conversation. He kept looking down at his phone and we were getting ready to leave. And he said, I was just, he said, I was just trying to catch some of our service back in Oregon. You know why? Cause that's his place. And, and you know what? You ought to thank God tonight. If God has brought you here, this is your place. I'm not looking to go anywhere. I'm not looking. I'm not. I'm not sending out resumes. No one wants me. You don't even want me. I'm not sending out resumes. I've been here since 1983 on staff, since 1983. And I've told you this before, but two times, two times, ministries have called me and said, would you, would you consider coming and helping us? Two times. And, uh, and, I, and I prayed both times and God didn't give me any liberty about that. You know, it's a wonderful thing. I, I wrote letters to all of our couples and to many of you, I said, it is such a refreshing thing to watch you drive your roots down deep and, and grow where you're planted. I'm sure there are many places that, I'm, I'm sure there's many places that I, I could probably find a pulpit if there's a lot of church, a lot of churches tonight don't have a pastor. Pastors are quitting. COVID has taken a toll on everyone. I'm telling you, it's been devastating to a lot of pastors. They just, they, they, they just they threw in the towel. They went to do something else. I, I know I could find a place. I know. I'm sure if, if I were to go home tonight and get on my Facebook and say, you know what, I resigned today. I'm looking for another ministry. I feel like somebody would probably send me a direct message and say, hey, could we talk? But I, you know what? This is my place. And the same God who led me here. I went to see Brother Hiles, Brother Francis. I went to see Brother Hiles my senior year on a Sunday night. And you used to go to his line on a Sunday night. And he would be in his office and you would wait in line. Sometime 40, 50, 60, 70 people deep. And you would wait in line to get his advice. And I remember uh, you didn't even sit down. And he would meet with people like that, just like popcorn visits. And then if he felt like you needed more time, he would schedule a time where you'd go sit down. I remember I walked in and, and uh, he shook my hand and called my name. And, and we stood behind his door and I said, my pastor wants me to go back and serve on staff at Durham, North Carolina in, at Fellowship Baptist Church. He knew Brother Graves and... Uh, he said, uh, Brother Rick, I think I, I, I would have no objection to that. I think that would be a good thing. Man, I had no idea. I had no idea what this was all going to involve. But I'm, and I'm not, I'm just testifying, okay? Amen. From that day until this, I just felt like this was my place. Amen. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. There's no one. Hey, look. If, if, I, if I leave here, I will leave here kicking and screaming 
from the way you respond in the night, I may be leaving here. <laughs> it's not always been easy. It's not always been fun. It's not always been pleasant. But I can tell you this, it's always been the place that God has for my wife and I. You know, you ought to thank God he, he placed you here. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to leave us all here, but I can promise you this. He knows where you live. Back several years ago, one of the two places that asked me to consider coming was the church where Brother Kevin Dale is. And Pastor Dalton died, and the family called me and asked me to come up. Actually, their, their assistant pastor called me the day after Brother Dalton passed away and said, would you come up and help us? We have got to have help. And I remember going up there. <clears throat> they lost my luggage. It was a snowstorm. I was supposed to preach <clears throat> that night. I think it was, I want to say a Wednesday night maybe when I was supposed to preach. And, and uh, I didn't have... I had, I had no, I didn't have a suit. I, I didn't have, I had tennis shoes. And John Peck picked me up at the airport and we went to Coles. And I got a sport coat and a pair of pants and a belt and a shirt and a tie and a pair of shoes. And went to the church and, and put them on and preached that night. And, uh, and help, I think the Lord let us help them. I stayed there for a week. And then... They started calling me. Well, we need some, we need some candidates. Uh, they got a couple of candidates. Didn't any of them work out? Stephen, we're glad you're here tonight. But didn't any of them work out? And, um, and the guy called me one day, and he said, Brother Finley, he said, the guys just keep asking me, would you consider coming and being our pastor? Michigan? And I, I said, I said, Brother Bill, I, I'll pray about it. I don't, have, I don't have any inclination. And I did. I prayed about it for a week. I called him back. I said, Brother, I, I have no peace. I think this is my place. Amen. I won't tell you exactly how it all played out. But they asked me about Brother Kevin. And I said, you know, I know he wants to pastor. I, I have no idea of the timing. And so I talked to Kevin, and, and he said, if you think you should give him my name, that's fine. So they started calling him. They spent like three days trying to get him. And finally, the guy called me back, Stephen. This is the way it happened. The guy called me back. He said, I can't get him to answer his phone. I said, he saw your area code, bro. <laughs> I said, I can tell you, if you believe, if you want him, you're going to have to pursue him because he don't want to leave. And they finally got him and they did all the questionnaires and everything. And he went up and he candidated and they said, we're going to vote on a Sunday, on a Wednesday night. I think it was a Wednesday night. We're going to vote. And uh, they told Brother Kevin, said, we'll call you right after the service and let you know how the vote goes. About 10 o'clock that night, the pulpit committee chairman called me. He said, Brother Finley, he won't answer his phone. <laughs> True story. And I said, I told you six weeks ago, if you want him, you're going to have to pursue him. He don't want to leave. And the next day, Brother Kevin called me. My wife and I were at a mall sitting in a parking lot. And he called. He said, Preacher, you got him in? I said, yeah. He said, do you... Do you, can you find any reason, is there anything, do you have any reservation, is there anything that would lead you to believe this would be a bad move for me? Because if it looks like this is what the Lord wants, but if you just say no, I'll call him back and tell him no. <laughs> and I said, no, Doc, I don't, I can't think of a reason. I know, Miss Pickens, you hate me, I'm sorry, but, uh, <clears throat> but that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Let God put you somewhere and just, and just serve and be grateful. Don't be looking around at other opportunities thinking, you know, if I was there, 
If, if I was able to serve in that church, if I was able to preach in that church, if I was able, you know what I've learned in my years of ministry and traveling and talking to preachers, every church has issues. He was grateful. He was grateful for his placement. He was grateful for God's grace and mercy. Verse 13, who was before a blasphemer. Paul's talking about his own life. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hey, stop and think about it. Church, stop and think about it. Can you get over the fact God is willing to use people like us? He's not, he's not picky. We ought to thank God for his grace and mercy. If he ever uses us to do anything, it will not be because of our merit or because of our talents, or because of our gifts, or because of our abilities, or because of our education, or how many degrees we have, or, or how much experience we have. If he ever chooses to use us to, 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 to build a home, to raise children, to preach a sermon, to sing a song, to, to teach a lesson, if he ever chooses to use us, it will all be his grace and his mercy. And we can thank God for that. Because we're pretty pitiful. He said, I was blasphemous. I was a persecutor. I was injurious. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Brother Mason alluded to this morning, do you know of anyone in the New Testament was used in a greater way than the Apostle Paul? I don't know of one. But by his own testimony, here's what he thought. I'm the worst of the worst. I'm the chief of sinners. Verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show himself Forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life <coughs> everlasting. You know where we ought to be tonight? We ought to be in hell right now. Every one of us burning for eternity. But look at us. We're, we're people of God. We're children of God. We're part of his family. Many of you got to occupy a place in a choir and sing for him tonight. Or play for him, or stand here and sing for him, or, or help in the nursery for him. God, in spite of us, because of his grace and his mercy, we ought to thank God tonight. Look, you get off your stinking high horse and think you deserve better, and you deserve more money, and you deserve more opportunity, and you're more privilege, and more title, and you ought to fall on your face and say, God, I cannot get over the fact you let me do anything for you. Be a grateful minister. Be grateful for your motivation. It's very important you determine what motivates you because if your motivation is wrong, you won't last long. You say, preacher, what do you mean? If you do it for man, or you do it for recognition, or you do it for money, or you do it for success, you do it because... Because the juices flow when you're successful. If you have a bunch of people on your bus route that somehow give you some sense of self-worth. Well, I'm just going to help you with something. You ain't always going to be successful. And sometimes you're going to fall flat on your face. Now, I appreciate, I appreciate what Brother Ken has said a couple of times. He said, Boy, this morning's message was a classic. Well, let me just help you. They ain't all classics. Sometimes, well, now you say amen. Okay, whatever. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, man, I'm telling you, you preach three or four times in the same pulpit for 34 years. They ain't all classics. Ain't many of them classics. 
So if success, if good sermons are my motivation, some days I'm going to have a hard time being motivated. If a full class or a full bus is my motivation, sometimes I'm going to have a hard time being motivated. If all the kids in your school class teacher, if them making the honor roll is your motivation, you're not going to be motivated very long. But look at what Paul said. We're almost done. Look at verse number 17. Now unto the king. Immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what I think he was saying? That's my motivation. I do what I do for him. I do what I do for his sake. It is my way of worship. It is my way of, of letting him know that I'm grateful for what he's done in my life. That's got to be your motivation. If your motivation is a pat on the back, those days when you get a kick in the seat of the pants, you're not going to be motivated. I I don't do a very good job. I, I wish I was better at expressing gratitude for things. But if... If, if you guys, you two guys, if, if you got to have a, a sweet note in your mailbox from the pastor every week to keep you motivated, you won't be motivated very often. <laughs> but if your motivation is serving the king, yeah. you know what he said? Here's what he said. You can't even give somebody a cup of cold water that I don't know about it. When you serve the Lord in ministry, whether it's for compensation or volunteer, you need to be sure you're doing it for His honor and glory. You know what I've learned? I'll never make everyone happy, but I can make Him happy. I'll never satisfy everyone, but I can satisfy Him. Some people will never understand me, but He knows the innermost workings of my heart. He knows my down-sitting and my uprising. He knows every thought that comes between my ears. He knows everything about me. Some people will never be pleased, but he is pleased with something as simple as faith. So I I want to challenge all of us, but especially you guys, be sure he's the reason you do what you do. He's the reason why you do what you do. And then the last thing, and I'm done. I, I, I think we ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful for a fight. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Hey, you know what? We're in a battle. Did you see? Who knows? Who knows? I get it. Who, who knows? I don't trust any media. All right? And I realize that anything you see could be fabricated. It could be an old picture. But I was watching a video the other day in Ukraine where an 80-year-old man came and enlisted to fight for his country. That. That gets me fired up, man. I watch videos where dads took their children and their wives and put them on buses and said goodbye to them, not knowing if they'd ever see them again so that they could stay back and fight. Can I just tell you that this, what we're doing, this is a good fight. And it is something worth fighting for. You know, we talk about patriotism, and I like to think that, I, matter of fact, I believe with all my heart that I'm a patriot, and I love America, and I think America is worth fighting for, and, and I think America is worth dying for. It is a great nation. I love her. 
But, but you hear me tonight, and I'm done. I'm going to stop. Being willing to fight for your country is one thing. Being willing to fight for the Lord is another. And whether you understand this or not tonight, the war that is raging within our borders tonight is not a political war. It is a spiritual war. This is between good and evil. And there ought to be some people somewhere who say, I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to fight. I'm grateful tonight. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of reasons why I'm grateful. My heart is full. But I'm, I'm grateful tonight that I get to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you would help us use these thoughts. Bless these men. In just a few moments, some of us will lay hands on them, and a good man will pray over them, and we will say to you, we agree with your call upon their lives. We believe you have called them to ministry. But before we get there, Lord, I pray that you would walk up and down these rows and in and out of these pews and speak to these men and women, these teenagers, these even children who are in attendance tonight. And Lord, those of us who name the name of Jesus, may we realize we, we are to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to be involved in ministry. Every one of us, every one of us. He gave some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want you to stand tonight. I'm not going to ask a bunch of questions. <clears throat> but tonight, if God might have spoken to your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to make a decision for him. Are you serving the Lord with your life? You may not be a Sunday school teacher. Not everyone can teach Sunday school. Not everyone can sing in the choir. Not everyone can drive the bus. But everyone can do something. And when you go... When you go to work tomorrow, you ought to minister. You ought to be involved in ministry tomorrow. When you young people go to school tomorrow, you ought to go to school to minister. May God help us all. Father, I pray you would bless this invitation. Stir our hearts tonight for the work of the ministry. What a blessing. What a privilege. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name. So play if you need to come tonight. God spoke to you maybe. You use the altar as God leads. If you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you'll never work your way there, my friend. You'll never, you'll never do enough ministry for Him to say, okay, I'm going to let you in. It's only, it's only through the blood of Jesus. That's the only hope any of us have. It's only through our faith in Christ. It's only by His blood.
Our Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. So many people in this room tonight live exactly what I preached. And they challenge me. And I'm oftentimes convicted to see godly lay people laboring in ministry, sacrificing time, giving of themselves, not because they have a title or a position or a paycheck, but because they want to serve you. You are the king, and it's a privilege to serve the king. And I pray you would help all of us to leave here with a mindset for ministry, looking for opportunities. We're talking this year about doing good. That's ministry. When we do good, when we love people for Jesus' sake. I also pray tonight, unashamedly, that you would continue to raise up laborers. I pray that you would begin to work maybe in the hearts of some of our young people about spending their lives serving you. And, and may we all leave here in just a few moments with a different, a different mindset. Uh, about serving the King. We thank you for what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, we have some folks for baptism. That's a good thing, is it not? So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have a song um, on the program. I have asked, if you guys want to come up and take a seat, I have asked uh, Brother Clint and Brother Charlie just to take just a few minutes and share a brief testimony with you about their call, their calling, and uh, just whatever the Lord has given them, just for a few moments. And I think by the time both of them are done, I can be ready to baptize. We'll be really close if not. And then after we baptize, we have a very brief video, about two and a half minutes, that I want us to see. And uh, then we'll have... Brother Francis, say just a word, and we'll pray, and we'll be ready uh, to be dismissed. So um, let's see. Uh, Charlie, I've got you down first. So he's going to come, and then as soon as he's done, Brother Clint, you come, and uh, I'll go up and get ready, although I, I'll have to go back and listen to their testimonies, and I will. Uh, I'll go up and get ready while uh, we continue on with our service, all right? I want to say thank you, entire church. Um, I grew up here. And so all of you have a part in tonight. And I was planning on saying thank you before he preached on a grateful minister. It, there's people in here who taught me Sunday school as, as a little kid probably kept me in the nursery and all the way up through and I just want to say thank you preacher asked us to give our testimony and uh, I jotted some notes down just to make sure I didn't forget anything because um, you get up here and you get nervous I remember probably 11 12 years old at our youth conference uh, to be very honest I was probably sitting pretty close to where I sat tonight and I remember the Lord called me to be a preacher. Uh, I remember surrendering that night. Uh, preacher had us all come up on the platform. I stood up there in the choir loft up underneath the screen as a uh, little 11, 12 year old boy. I really wasn't little, but uh, age wise, uh, 11, 12 year old boy. And, and not even knowing what that meant, you know, at 12 years old. Um, and not, you know, and my students in the school, they pick on me because I tell them I'm not an extrovert. I'm very much an introvert. And they're like, no, you talk all the time. Uh, it's because that's what they pay me to do is talk for 50 minutes of class. Um, then when I was about 13 years old, uh, we were at teen camp in uh, Hillsville, Virginia. And Brother Bob Hooker preached a message on hell, and he scared me to death. And uh, I can remember saying that I was saved all along. You know, I think I said I was saved since I was four years old. 
Uh, but that night, uh, you know, he said it doesn't matter what mama wrote down in a Bible if you don't remember for yourself. And I remember trusting Christ as my Savior at teen camp. And then as I got older, my senior year, I remember fighting with God. I knew God wanted me to go to Bible college, uh, but I didn't want to go to Bible college. And, uh, and uh, I actually think I was thinking about this afternoon. I think it was Brother Mason who preached at our fall. We used to have like an October, like a two-day teen revival type thing. We would go up to some camp like an hour from here. And I remember uh, surrendering and told God, you know, I'll do whatever you want to do. And I went to Bible college. And all through, you know, going to Bible college, I thought God wanted me to be in missions. Uh, I studied missions. Uh, I went to Africa. I've uh, been to Mexico, Jamaica. Uh, I thought that's what I was going to do. We got married in June of 2014. <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember that that fall, you know, God saying, what are you waiting on? And I start, we started making preparations to go to the mission field in January, December, December, January of that, that year and the following year, uh, God started closing some doors and made it very apparent that we were not supposed to go to the mission field. And it was the first week of February and I went to the preacher and he alluded to that phone call uh, from Pastor Rossi. First week of February, I went to preacher and I said, hey doc, you, you know what I'm doing and it, it looks like every door is closing, and he said, well, stop pushing and take one month and pray, and it was literally almost a month to the day that Pastor Rossi called him. Uh, it was that couples retreat, and, you know, we're sitting in a session, and he says, Charlie, I need to talk to you afterwards. I'm thinking, oh, man, what I do? And, uh, you know, and he same conversation that he told you earlier, and uh, that June, we moved to Maryland, and yes, uh, it involved much more than coaching the game of basketball, uh, and uh, and I'm thankful, you know, now seeing the, the, the things, and there's other things that happened before that of what God did to prepare me for that and to prepare me for where I am now, and then it was in, in 2018, 2019, God, uh, like Preacher said, stirred us, and, and we decided to come home, and a couple months later, Preacher reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like for you to, to work here in and, and when I say I'm living my dream, uh, I'm living my dream. And, you know, we talk to basketball players, you know, you got you to gotta go there in your mind. And I've hit the game-winning shot in my driveway against Duke Blue Devils 100 times, okay? I'm a Carolina fan. <laughs> I did. I've done that. And, you know, and we, we have dreams. But when it comes to life and the ministry – I, I'm living my dream, and, and I want to thank you for letting me have a part. I teach many of your kids in school or junior church, and uh, it is an honor and a blessing to be home. And like Preacher said, I, this is my place, and, uh, and if, if God makes me leave, I'll be kicking and screaming like, like he said. Uh, and so I, I want to thank you, church, for making it possible and allowing me uh, to serve in ministry here. All right, come right ahead. We'll go ahead and baptize, and then Clint will share with us. Let me have your card in your hanky. Someone's excited. Turn and face the ladies. All right. And this is Kristen Hutchinson, and Kristen has trusted Jesus as her Savior. Follows the Lord in baptism <clears throat> this evening, Christian, upon a public profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. God bless you, Christian. the ladies. This is Millie Curran, and Millie has trusted Christ, follows the Lord in baptism. Millie, upon a public profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your own personal Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection.
Got one more. Let me have your hand. All right, turn and face up where your mom is. All the way up there. All right. And this is Avery Curran, uh, Millie's sister. And she follows the Lord in baptism tonight. Avery, upon a public profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All right. Brother Clint's going to go. If I'm not down when he finishes, just sit tight. I was born and raised in uh, northwest Indiana under the uh, ministry of First Baptist Church of Hammond. Uh, some of my earliest memories are being in church. My parents are here tonight, and I want to publicly thank my parents for raising me in church. Um, I never missed a Sunday. Uh, I never missed a Wednesday. And, and I owe that to, to my parents for, for raising me right and raising me in church. In 2005, in, on a November Sunday night, uh, I can't remember what the pastor preached about, but I knew I wasn't saved. And I went to my dad, and he showed me the plan of salvation, and I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know this might sound funny, but growing up, I always, deep down inside, knew and felt that I was going to serve the Lord full-time in ministry when I grew up. I remember in high school, my friends talking about what college they're going to and where they want to work and their dream job. And I always just remember thinking, you know, I feel like the Lord wants me to serve him. And after graduation in 2013, that summer, the Lord made it very obvious, very evident in my life that he wanted, to serve, uh, wanted me to serve him full time. I went to Hiles Anderson to Bible College to get my training. I met my wife, Amber, there. And uh, shortly after graduation, the pastor reached out to me, and uh, he, he offered me an opportunity to come here and serve and I am extremely thankful for him for giving a 22-year-old kid an opportunity to serve the Lord here at Fellowship. It's my honor and joy. Uh, I love to call this place home. And I'm extremely thankful that I get to serve him here with you guys. Of course, I have been, <clears throat> I'm out of breath. Uh, I have been Charlie's pastor his entire life. And um, Clint was blessed, uh, at least the last few years. Uh, he has an uncle who pastors the First Baptist Church in Hammond. And we're going to hear just real quickly from Pastor John Wilkerson. Clint, congratulations on the opportunity to be set aside and to be recognized as someone who's been called by God to do what God wants you to do. Those of us here at First Baptist Church of Hammond, where you grew up and where you received your training, we're so proud of you. We're so thankful that your heart has been uh, to please the Lord, to reach others for Christ, and to be a good testimony uh, with you and your precious wife, Amber. We love you and we thank God for you. I'd like to admonish you with a couple things. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, as Paul told Timothy, he said, um, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, a good conscience and a faith that is unfeigned. I'd like to encourage you to follow those three admonitions. Love God and others out of a pure heart. It's not an easy task because our heart isn't always pure. But keep love as a paramount goal in your life for God and for others. Number two, I would encourage you to keep your conscience clean. It's nothing softer than a clean conscience to lay down at night, to know there's nothing between our soul and the Savior, nothing between our soul and another man or woman on the planet. I'd like to encourage you to keep a clean conscience. And uh, only you can keep that for you, and I can keep that for me, and it's everyone's individual responsibility. Then lastly, I would say, have a faith that is unfeigned. Uh, be real. Be genuine. Love and, and care for people out of a genuine heart. Keep your motives pure, your morals pure. And keep on strengthening the skills that God's given you, but make sure you maintain integrity of heart. 
Uh, this world doesn't need another cheap imitation of itself. It needs somebody who is a real child of God, emulating the person of Jesus Christ. Our sermons whisper, but our life, it shouts. And I pray that God would help you to have a love out of a pure heart, have a clean conscience and a clean life, and then a faith that is real and uh, not in any way fake. I'd like to also commend the Fellowship Baptist Church and Pastor Finley. What wonderful people you are. Thank you for your legacy of faith and love to the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for continuing on in a life for the Lord. Thank you for recognizing the gifts that God has put on Clint's life. And I pray that God would use you in a wonderful way to do this over and over again for the glory of God and for the kingdom in which uh, he wants to reign. And uh, may we keep propagating the gospel of Christ through men and materials, uh, media and money. And may the Lord bless you on this special evening. Amen. That's wonderful. One more person I want us to hear from before we pray over these men, and that is Clint's dad, Brother John Francis. Uh, actually, Pastor Wilkerson is also Clint's uncle, and his dad, Brother John Francis, is an assistant pastor there uh, at First Baptist Church. He's going to take just a few minutes and uh, share a couple of thoughts, and then after that, I'll come back, Brother John, and I'll get everything together, and I'll have you close us in prayer. It's a uh, great privilege to be part of this service tonight and, of course, uh, know Clint very well, being our son and, and Charlie. <laughs> I remember Charlie in, in Bible college and uh, sure, certainly admire him as a young man and as a, and as a man who loves the Lord and wants to serve God with his life. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, the Bible says, How then shall they call on him in, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I thank God that, the, that God is still calling young men to preach. And I would challenge every young man in this room, if God ever taps you on the shoulder and gives you a nudge, that you answer that call. If you were to gather a group of grade school boys in a room and ask them what would they like to be when they grow up. Most of the answers would be, I want to be a fireman, maybe a policeman. You'd probably find one who, who would say he'd want to be the president of the United States. But very rarely would you find a, a young boy who would say, I want to be a preacher. Because I think it's something that God does. God has to reach down and tap young men on the shoulder and say, I want you. I want you to surrender your life to serve me. And I think most preachers would, would agree they had other plans. They had other dreams and other visions for their life until God came one day and tapped them on the shoulder and said, I want you to surrender. It was a great day in my life when I surrendered my life to serve the Lord and had no intention of going to Bible college, had no intention of, of being in the ministry, but going to a conference, the exact same conference that Brother Finley went to just a few years later in 1983, and God called me, and I answered that call. And then several years later, after finishing Bible college, getting my training, being asked to work on staff at a church was a highlight of my, of my, of my life. And uh, to be able to do in a full-time manner what God had called me to do was a great day. And it's a great privilege to serve the Lord. And uh, I want to just say three things to you men that are, that are being ordained tonight. First, I want to say that it's an honor to serve the Lord. And what we do, we do for Jesus' sake. And uh, love your preacher, but do it for Jesus. Amen. Do it for the Lord. And uh, the truth is, uh, men sometimes disappoint. And sometimes we're disappointed in our leaders, but, but we'll never, you'll never be disappointed in the Lord. And, and do it for God. Second, I would, I would say this. It's an honor, not only an honor to serve the Lord, but it's an honor to serve God's people. 
It's a privilege to being a place where God's people gather every week and you have an opportunity to serve them. And that's why you're here. That's why God wanted you to be in the ministry to serve God's people. And then lastly, I'd say this. It's an honor to, to share God's truth about salvation. Verse 13, the verse I did not read, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a verse that we use in soul winning. And it's a great privilege to be able to tell somebody how to go to heaven when they die. And I would just challenge you men that are being ordained tonight, never stop being a personal soul winner. Never substitute your role in the, in the church, in the ministry, for being a personal soul winner, winning people to Jesus Christ. Because that's really why God wanted you to be in the ministry, was for his eternal purpose. I remember the day I was ordained. I had the privilege of being ordained by Brother Jack Hiles. And it was a wonderful day. And, uh, and, and I'll never forget it. My wife and I were there together. There was, a, I think, two other men who were also being ordained to the ministry. And it was a highlight. It was a highlight of, of, my, of my life. And uh, no doubt tonight is a highlight for these men, a day that uh, they'll never forget. Because it's as it has already been said, it's your pastor and it's God's people and the church family saying we put our stamp of approval on you as a minister, as a servant of God, and, uh, and let's, let's follow the admonition that's been given this evening. Thank you. If you'll just hold on to this. I'm going to ask <clears throat> uh, Clint and Charlie to come and kneel here uh, facing that way, and if you ladies will come behind them, you're, you're, get behind your husband. And then I'm going to ask our deacons uh, if they would, and then any of our uh, ordained staff men who are here, if you'll come. But John, if you want to go down to where you can lay hands on them as well, and I'm going to come down, and uh, Brother Francis is going to pray uh, over these men and pray for their wives and pray for God to use them in a great way. He's already using them. And we're grateful for that. But, uh, but we, we want, as a church, uh, to say we believe in these men. And we believe in the call of God upon their lives. So uh, I'll come down. And if you guys can get close enough to put your hands on one of these men, that'll be fine. If not, that's fine. And uh, Brother Francis, you pray. And we'll conclude our service. Father, we thank you. For this opportunity and this time that we've set aside to ordain these choice young men for the ministry. Thank you for their desire, their heart of surrender. Thank you for their labor of love. Thank you for their willingness to work hard, to do the hard things to give their life to serving you and serving your people. We do pray that you would bless them in a very special way, a very unique way. We pray you'd bless their families, bless their wives, bless their children. We pray that these men would be the men of God that you have wanted them to be before they were even conceived. God, I pray that you would use them in this church for this community in a wonderful way. God, thank you for calling young men to preach. Thank you that you're in the soul-saving business, that you want people to know the truth. And I pray that these men in their area of responsibilities, in the school, in the bus ministry, and other areas of this church would always be focused on serving, pleasing you, and winning the lost to Christ. Thank you for Brother Finley, for his, his vision, his passion, his love for this church. We pray that you would continue the work that's already been begun here with these men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, fellas. Lord bless you, man.
what you got there, okay? <clears throat> Bless you, bro. Yes, sir. All right. What a wonderful day. Brother Ken said it earlier. I believe this. I believe one of the jobs of the church is to raise up laborers and train them 